Would you say that next generation sequencing is really going to be transformational to the fields of forensic genomics? I think it's going to be another one of those transformational tools. We've had a number of these over the years from restriction digestion capabilities and southern blotting, which today seems almost trivial and mundane, but at that time was rather phenomenal what it could do, to the polymerase chain reaction, which is still some of our foundation that I think improved molecular biology across the board, to some other methods per se, but now we have this tool that allows us to do things in such magnitude in, an, in other ways that it can overcome certain problems that we have today, but allows us to look at things in more depth and, to, and analyze many more samples in a parallel multiplex fashion. So I think it's gonna be the next, uh, no pun intended, the next generation of tools that we will use. Do you see next generation sequencing enabling new capabilities in forensic genomics? Well, there's a number of areas that I think will go beyond what we think of today as forensics. One area that we have a lot of interest in and we're working on uh, right now is pharmacogenomics and combining that with molecular autopsies, or at least the principles of pharmacogenomics. We know that a number of us have genes that pr uh, pose um, risks to environmental insults, stresses that can cause us problems or give us advantages, in, in fact. There are a number of situations where it may be important to look at the genetic constitution of an individual to help determine what may have been the cause or manner of death. For example, one of the cases we like to give as, an, as a sort of a, an explanation of the capabilities would be there was a situation where a 13-day-old newborn died of morphine poisoning. And typically when that occurs, the police are going to investigate because it's an unusual death and uh, they're gonna search first the parents, if the mother had a boyfriend or anyone else who may have done something to the, the child, and they also may look at the hospital for negligence or some other problem, drug, you know, the pharmacy or something like that. In this particular case, the mother was given codeine for an episiotomy at, you know, during birth, and she was an ultra-metabolizer of codeine, and codeine metabolizes into morphine. So essentially what she did was breastfeed her child morphine. And the way you can determine that she was an ultra metabolizer is she has a particular gene, which we don't have to go into now, she has a double dose of that gene, and we could determine that through this kind of work and other kinds of variants. Knowing that she had that double dose takes the investigation in a different direction that we knew what the cause of death was, but now the manner of death was an accident and not, you know, an intentional homicide or some other nefarious act. And so these kinds of genetic marker typing can help us better elucidate what may have happened in unknown or un unexplained deaths of individuals. And the fact that we can sequence a large number of genes at one time and look objectively at all the variants that may be there may help us in better determining the cause of death. Every new technology experiences a growth curve and early adopters like yourself are leading the way. How long do you think it will take for next-generation sequencing to be adopted by the forensic community, and which applications do you think will be the first ones? I think the first ones will be the standard forensic markers we've talked about, the, these repetitive uh, markers like short tandem repeats and specific SNPs that are of value. The, uh, the process will take a while, and there will be some that will go out ahead of time, and others will wait because there's a number of issues there. And the most important is, is that forensic scientists mostly do casework. They don't have time to research and develop and get familiar with new technologies as easily because they've invested in certain technologies and most of their time is dedicated to their work. The other thing is, is with any new technology, you can expect there will be challenges in the legal system where science and law meet are not always a simple process and there's always going to be challenges as the, um, I expect mostly the government will be presenting the evidence and it'll be the defense's obligation to challenge it. It's not right or wrong in the sense of how you feel, it's the system and that's what we should support. And so a lot of forensic scientists have invested a lot in the systems that exist now and we've been through the challenges. So only a few are gonna be willing to go out and get the exposure or the the ad adversarial setting and want to endure that, so they'll wait for a few others to do that first. I don't see that as a serious issue because if you do good science and you document it, validate what you do, 
publish it, then the, the court, they will take some care of itself in the courts, but we can't expect that. So that'll slow down the process some. The next thing is, is most people are driven by the ability to upload things in the CODIS. So if the systems being used can't upload its data that it generates in the CODIS, then there will be a slowdown in the process. That's why it's so imperative, I think, of CODIS to start thinking now of how to accommodate that and put it into their builds for their next version instead of waiting till it's all done before they start making another version. Mm -hmm.